So good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Wynne Trainer Quenvold. I'm the communications director at the Nashua River Watershed Association. Just wanted to welcome everybody this morning. It's fun to see so many faces bright and early on a Tuesday morning. Um, I think most of you are familiar with the, the NRWA. If you're not, um, we do water and land protection work. We do environmental education work. And we work in 32 communities in North Central Massachusetts and Southern New Hampshire. And we are dedicated partners in the Nashua, Squanicook, and Nisitissit Rivers Wild and Scenic Stewardship Council, um, who is presenting the program this morning. So I'll pass it to them. So I'll uh, introduce myself, Al Futterman. I'm the Land Programs Director at the NRWA. I'm also the Project Outreach and Coordinator at for the Nashua, Squanicook, Nisitissit Wild and Scenic River Stewardship Council, quite a mouthful. We generally refer to it as NSNWSR. And we do have a website, which I can't screen share with you, but it's wild and scenic Nashua rivers, plural.org. And there you will see that we meet uh, as a stewardship council uh, once a month, the third Thursday evening of the month that will be March 18th. It is open to the public, but mostly what it is, is the representatives from the 11 communities that make up the wild and scenic river area. Um, so rather than go through the 11 towns, uh, if you're interested in knowing who they are, just uh, look it up. So what we're doing today is an extension of a network gathering for conservation agents and friends. And today you're all friends. So we um, have been doing this for about a year and a half, two years, different conservation oriented topics. And this one is uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, Sarah's presentation. So let me introduce her and then we'll get started. Uh, this will be a recorded session. And um, thanks to Emma Lord, who is our National Park Service representative um, for our rivers. And Sarah is a Central Mass native. She has a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and a master's degree in water resources engineering, both from Tufts University. She's currently employed at Interflu, which is based out of the Pacific Northwest but has local offices in Cambridge, Mass, and in Wiscasset, Maine. Interfluve is an interdisciplinary firm that specializes in ecological restorations following dam removals. So we're very uh, lucky to have uh, Sarah present to us. I think you will, are willing to take questions as you go along. Otherwise, we'll save a little bit of time at the end for questions. And please feel <laughs> free to use the chat and take it away, Sarah. Oh, sure. Thanks, Al, for the introduction. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak to the Nashua River Watershed Association and friends on the topic of headwater streams and their importance and their function. For me, in a year where every day is felt like Groundhog's Day, today is a special occasion. <laughs> um, as Al said, my name is Sarah Whiting. I live in Shirley on the Squanicook River. I've lived here for about 16 years. I'm a water resources engineer by education and training. And for the past four years, I've been working specifically in the, in the interdisciplinary field of restoration. And also in the past six years, I've been an active member of the Town of Shirley Planning Board. So before I began this work in restoration, I spent about 12 to 13 years working with and for consulting firms in development and transportation design. So, you know, it's a little counterproductive, you know, the opposite of restoration. Um, but I'm really happy to be on this side of, of, the, um, of the work now. Um, and thank you, a special thanks to Martha Morgan and for you, Al, for your encouragement, especially over the years. Um, I wouldn't be here in the ecological restoration field now if it weren't for the subtle influence of the NRWA pervading like all things um, in my surroundings. So thank you. Um, I may have been a little ambitious when I outlined my topics for today, but if you take a handful of things home after this talk, um, I want to make sure that I communicate that our headwaters are lifeboats for biodiversity. Healthy headwaters are absolutely necessary 
if we're going to maintain good water quality at points downstream in our lakes, our ponds, our estuaries, and in our oceans. And healthy headwaters are the nurseries of healthy ecosystems. And healthy ecosystems are necessary if we're going to have any hope of restoring balance to the natural systems in our planet, which have gone so out of whack um, over the last, say, 100 years. Um, I'll divide this talk into what I'll call five stories. And if we run out of time, I'll just stop at the end of one story. Um, I want to start with an introduction to headwater streams so that we all have a baseline for understanding exactly what it is that we're talking about so that we can appreciate why the question, what is a headwater? Is so difficult. Okay. Wow. Well, so, I don't have anything to chatter. Uh, if everybody could please mute. All right. Uh, thank you. And um, like, what is the headwater and why that question is so difficult to answer, depending on where you stand in the legal world or in the scientific world, in the academic world, or in the pra practicing engineers? And then I'll tell a story of the function of a headwater with respect to water, land, and life. And then I'll jump into a story of the different cycles that um, that headwaters, you know, influence and are a part of, including the carbon cycle, the nutrient cycle. I mean, then to challenge our assumptions about how we may anticipate that, you know, headwaters, everything moves downstream. Um, we typically think in the downstream direction. I'll touch on the importance of connectivity in the upstream direction. And then lastly, if we have time, we'll talk about policy. I know this group is not afraid of getting involved in the legislative process. So um, I see, I have seen the gaps in the policy and what sometimes we fail to protect. And as a practitioner, or sometimes as a judge on the planning board, what I can and can't do uh, when I see something happening, you know, I, there's limitations to those tools right now. So I will start with the introduction to what is a headwater stream. What do they spark? What do those words spark in your imagination? Would you know one if you saw one? And the more time I spent researching this question on the academic level and the legal level, the less clear I became. So let's review some of the definitions. The EPA might say that a headwater stream is a part of a river farthest from the river's end point or confluence with another stream. And so this implies in its wording that a headwater is wet and flowing and that it's also distant either um, far away or high above um, the main stem river or the ocean, wet and distant. A geomorphologist might say, a first or a second or a third order stream. And we can argue about the semantics of what those different um, levels mean, but specifically a first order stream is a stream without a tributary. And the geomorphologist is trying to find a shorthand way to explain how water forms the land and how the land forms the water. A first order stream has no tributaries. And so we, you know, by definition, we might assume, you know, that's, that's a headwater if it has no tributaries. And a philosopher might say a headwater is the river's source. And this is a definition or an idea I can get behind. It's all encompassing and it's true. It doesn't limit us to a form. It doesn't limit us to a proximity or an altitude. It doesn't limit us to wet or dry and it doesn't limit us to river-like, pond-like or wetland-like. And while this definition may be the most true, it doesn't really do the trick helping us communicate the identification to others. And that's really important because we need to be able to communicate that definition so that we can help protect these areas. And so now I want to challenge what you think a headwater stream might look like. Um, they can be perennial, constantly flowing during all seasons. They can be intermittent, seasonal, you know, perhaps going dry, you know, in the growing season when groundwater levels drop either due to the vegetation or well withdrawals or they can be ephemeral and only flowing after rainfall or snow melt. Next, I'm gonna show a few photos of different types of headwater streams. And this isn't a comprehensive suite of photos, but my hope is that it spans the range and captures your imagination. Here's a glacier headwater photo. Um, I'm cheating here a little bit. With respect to the headwater definition by the EPA, you can't really get any higher or further away from a river main stem than this. 
and you have a roaring torrent of water emerging fully formed from the ice. And here's a photo, um, shout out to Martha Morgan here at the NRWA, this is Pearl Brook in Townsend, I think. Here we see what I think of as the quintessential headwater stream. You have large boulders, short cascades, musical babbling as it trickles its way downhill. Um, I think that this is what a typical layperson might understand first. Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Everyone here I'm sure has a lot of experience with rivers and streams, but I think if we were talking to just a member of the general public, this is what they would have in their imagination. Um, here's a photo, another photo by Martha um, of a wetland headwater. And this one may challenge our assumptions a little bit because it's not a river or a stream necessarily, but our rivers and streams need to start somewhere. And they don't always start as springs emerging from the mountainside. Often we see the wetlands, marshes, and bogs sitting in the high saddles along drainage divides. And sometimes these features have outlets on many sides. Um, the water that flows from them can end up in very different places. For example, in our local watershed, um, some of the higher altitude wetlands in the Princeton Wachusett area can spill east towards the Nashua, Merrimack, Atlantic Ocean, or west to the Ware, Chicopee, Connecticut River, you know, and then into Long Island Sound. But these interbasin headwaters can tie ecosystems across wide geographies together. And if something ha happens in, you know, the Connecticut River watershed, you know, they still have this nursery seed that can provide life um, downstream and vice versa. Um, and then I also want to um, challenge you maybe one maybe more one time. This is a this is a photograph uh, um, from Gibbet Hill. And this is an agricultural wetland. Um, uh, Groton was one of the earliest settlements, I think, in, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So it's been developed and used for agriculture for a very long time. Um, this particular area is not very far from the Nashua River and it's not very high. And if I took a step back, from this photo, you know, I'd be in the Merrimack River watershed and none of the drainage would go to the Nashua River. Um, but generally these wetland headwaters had very fertile soil that was ideal for agriculture. And historically they've been trenched and drained and they're susceptible to the types of impacts that agriculture brings. And historically this meant forest clearing, subsequent erosion and sedimentation and loss of soil um, and then animal waste. And so bacteria and things that come from that and more recently, we have our fertilizers, which become a source of nutrients and pesticides, which are a source of poisons. Um, in this particular um, wetland, which is just outside the center of Groton, um, you know, it's really clear that it's been trenched and drained um, for a long time. Um, so, what the headwater streams look like. Um, as I said before, they aren't always wet and they aren't always obvious. They can be intermittent or ephemeral. You could be looking at one right now. Um, you know, this is a drainage flow path in my backyard. Um, it gets, you know, it's wet sometimes. And I would say it's very important um, as a contributing area to the Nashua River watershed. So, um, just because an area looks dry 95% of the year doesn't mean that it's not important. And it's in these places where the land and water interact and intersect, where we haven't quite yet tuned our perception and our language and our legal protections to recognize that our headwaters gain their rich, complex biodiversity and their nutrients and their, oh, sorry, and their signature chemistry from areas like this. Um, these areas, I would say, are under the greatest pressure and are afforded the least protection from human activities, because if there's no water there, then how can it fall under the protection of the Clean Water Act, for example? Um, but these areas are instrumental to healthy headwaters. Um, so in preparation for this talk, um, I performed a little exercise to see how much of our local watershed is occupied by headwater streams. Here's a river network, the water's everywhere. Um, where are we likely to find headwaters? 
there's publications out there and the result you get depends on the scale of the map that you're looking at. But headwater streams make up between 50 and 90% of our river systems by length. The published value for central Massachusetts is that 57% of all river miles are headwaters. The red lines on this map are, this was my exercise, um, my interpretation. The red lines are the first order streams that have no tributaries. And I think it's clear from this image that you don't need to go very far or very high from the Nashua River itself to come across a headwater. So there's the comparison right there. <laughs> it covers just about everything. So why are they so important to us? I don't really plan to focus my talk on the function and importance of headwater streams with respect to humans or our economics or our commerce. Our current policies do enough of the work connecting the dots between our environment and our economy. And I think that's to our detriment and to the detriment of the environment. But on a basic fundamental level, without our headwater streams, we'll be as thirsty as the trees during last summer's drought because the headwaters provide 50% of our clean drinking water here in Massachusetts. And I think this map might misrepresent because I don't think that they're counting that Boston gets its headwater, gets its drinking water from like the Quabbin, for example. Um, so I'm gonna start to move into the next story. So that was my introduction to what is a headwater stream? What are, what's the variation and what they may look like and where we might find them. Um, and now I'm gonna move into the story of their structure and their function. And I'm gonna focus mostly on the babbling brook example that I showed earlier. Our headwaters are lifeboats of biodiversity. And if we have a healthy headwater and something happens to a river downstream, we have the source of the life and it can be reseeded and refed into the main stem rivers. Um, as we've seen, particularly here in the Nashua River watershed, we cleaned it up and it's doing great. Um, we can continue to do better, but we have most of our headwaters intact or mostly intact. And we've seen the restoration and the improvement um, okay, so now I'm going to go back to the water cycle, back to kindergarten and do a brief, a brief story of this cycle. So water evaporates from our oceans, from our lakes and our ponds. It transpires from our vegetation. It falls again as precipitation. And depending on where it lands, sometimes it's absorbed into the ground or sometimes it moves along the ground. Sometimes the moving water forms the stream channel, and sometimes the earth tells the land where, or tells the water where to go, um, or both, always both. It's an interaction, it's an interface. Water moves through the system, and the velocity of the flowing water forms the channel and the banks and the floodplain. The flowing water sorts the bed material into boulders, cobbles, gravel, sand, and silt. It deposits the bed material into pools and riffles. These are two pools and riffles. They're two very different forms that we often find adjacent to each other. And they host a variety of different life that benefits from the close proximity of the shallow, fast moving water over the riffles and the deep, slow moving water that moves through the pool. Um, on the riffles, this isn't quite a ripple. This is this is a, a literal headwater out in Williamsburg, Massachusetts. Um, the water springs from the mountainside right there. But on that bed substrate, you know, the bony big rocks, um, and sometimes in the pools too, we find our primary producers, our photosynthetic um, mosses and algae and lichen, and um, you know, adjacent we find our liverworts on the woody vegetation. And then in the pools, we find habitat for our, our amphibians and our macroinvertebrates. Um, we have, oh, I'm gonna, this is where I get into Gaynor's photos. She has so many <laughs> delightful ones. Some of these come from, um, from the web and in the notes for each slide, I attribute their source. Uh, I think that's important, but um, a lot of these come from the NRWA. We have our salamanders who, 
eat crustaceans and earthworms and small frogs and other salamanders. We have the frogs who eat the insects in the water and the spiders off the canopy and fish and crayfish um, and shrimp, small snakes and mollusks like slugs and snails and other frogs and tadpoles. There's a lot of cannibalism <laughs> in these um, in these waters. And then we have our mollusks in and out of water. Um, the mollusks are the grazers. Um, they graze on the photosynthetic plants and algae. Some are filter feeding. Um, the pools play host to our insects during one or many of their complex life stages. Um, today, I'm just gonna post a picture of the bog hunter because I love the name. And I know it's one of our local species. And also, you know, turtles and other amphibians. Um, this is another one of our, our special species, the Blanding's turtle. It overwinters near pools um, in mud or water, vegetative debris. You know, it has a diet similar to the frogs, you know, it's omnivores, um, and also consumes vegetation adjacent to the um, stream. Moving on to some of the, the structure of the stream on the vegetated banks, we have our canopy our leafy vegetation. The canopy can be shrub-like or it can include mature or tall trees. The deciduous canopy recycles food into the system. So the fallen and decaying leaves are broken down by the herbivores and by bacteria and fungus and are absorbed into the biomass of the diverse plant, animal and fungal life in and out of the water. That summer canopy also provides shade to keep the waters cool for our cold water friends, such as trout. And then when we have mature trees alongside our rivers, um, we also have the opportunity to accumulate large woody debris. The fallen trees provide habitat, delightful hiding places for our smaller animal friends. The wood provides food for the fungus and the saprobes, who then in their turn, or and particularly the fungus, um, becomes food for our animal friends. And so there's this cycle of biomass you know, eat or be eaten and everything um, keeps consuming and adding to the biomass across um, the plants, the animals and, you know, the fungus. So. The fallen wood becomes influential in the channel form. It traps sediment and organic material from upstream, which is, can be very nutrient rich. And that finer sediment provides a foothold for an even greater diversity of plants, animals, and fungus. Um, so we've just spent a few minutes talking about, oh, actually, you know what? Here's where I added some of the photos from Gionor. Adjacent to our headwater streams, we start to see the diversity of life extending onto the shores. We have our small mammals that come to the shores and consume the vegetation. Oh, we have our reptiles who take the opportunity <laughs> to hunt our smaller mammals. Um, we have our raptors who come and hunt from above at the, when there's an abundance of food. And they require quite a lot of um, uninterrupted habitat to feel comfortable and settled in an area. Um, these are from my backyard. Um, and then we also host our large mammals. And these two particularly happen to be herbivores, but um, I didn't want to show the bobcat and the fisher cat. The pictures are not very good, <laughs> but they are also, you know, they, they come to join the, the party. Um, and then we have our resident aquatic bird species. And then we have our, our visitors who enjoy proximity to our, well, our headwaters. This life fills every niche from the macroscopic to the giant. It includes producers and consumers. It includes hunters and grazers. And the forms of life are diverse and unique at all scales. And so now I wanna introduce a metaphor because here's where I see the problem with um, human intervention and in our cycles and our life cycles. A non-functioning headwater is akin to a water slide. The water and the nutrients and the carbon and the sediment race to the bottom. What is the bottom? It's our estuaries and our seas. It 
could be the bottom of our lakes and ponds. The race to the bottom doesn't support that interconnected, diverse life that we've just been looking at. A functioning headwater is more like, and this is an analogy that I thought was appropriate, it's more like Archimedes' screw. It cycles and cycles and cycles. It's where the interface between the water and the land evolves to a cyclical equilibrium where the water and nutrients are churned and churned and used and recycled in a slow progression downstream, optimizing and maximizing life along the path. So when we damage our headwaters and we opt for that water slide, things run amok on so many different levels on the small scale and the big scale, the planetary scale. Um, and so now I wanna get into a couple of the cycles that are really important to us right now as we understand what's going on with the planet. And I wanna tie headwater streams, the role of headwater streams into helping regulate and balance some of these cycles. Um, this is also ambitious. Some people spend their entire career studying the cycles I'm about to talk about, and I'm just gonna give two, two or three slides to each one. Um, so we'll just get started with this. So the carbon cycle, um, animals and plants that live on earth, earthlings are carbon life forms. Carbon is instrumental in life as we know it. Photosynthetic plants use sunlight and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to grow and they accumulate biomass. And as long as they're alive and the carbon is part of their bodies, you know, it's, it's outside the atmosphere, which, you know, our problem today is we have too much in the atmosphere. The vegetation is consumed by grazers and the grazers are consumed by hunters and on and on. And then when carbon life forms die, some of the carbon goes back into the atmosphere through the work of bacteria and fungus. And then there are other times when um, carbon life forms die and the conditions where they, there's no oxygen or maybe the environment is too acidic, they don't decay. Think like peat bogs and on the geologic time scale, that's where we get the formation of our coal and our oil. And then now we burn our fossil fuels. So we're putting eons worth of that historic sequestered carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere all at once. And we understand that there's an urgency to stopping this, you know, as fast as we can. So with respect to um, carbon and headwater streams, I'm going to talk about two primary reservoirs of carbon, the carbon in the biomass um, and the carbon in the soil. And I'm going to leave out the water. Um, there is carbon dioxide dissolved in water and it does move downstream to the ocean, but our two biggest reservoirs related to headwaters or biomass and soil. We have to protect the biomass and we have to protect the soil to maintain the balance. We wanna keep churning like Archimedes screw. We don't want the water slide straight to the atmosphere. The planet can't support it. So to restore balance, we need to encourage carbon sequestration in the life cycle and the biomass. We need to avoid uh, like with the large woody debris, um, I've learned through my work here at Enderflu that it's you know best to leave the large wood where it lies, avoid burning it. Fully submerged wood will last indefinitely. Partially submerged wood will decay slowly, but bring about the opportunity for new life on an appropriate time scale. Um, and both bacteria and fungus play an important amount of an important role in the amount of carbon that can be sequestered in soil. Soil is one of the biggest reservoirs of carbon dioxide. Um, practitioners of regenerative farming work to optimize and increase the carbon content in any way that they can. Um, some of the bacteria um, promotes that off-gassing of carbon dioxide and sometimes uh, I'm losing my place a little bit here. But some of that bacteria is also beneficial because it helps provide some nutrients that we'll talk about later. Um, forest soils generally have longer term stability and have more time to develop complex communities of fungus. And there are certain species of fungus that are better than others for maintaining carbon in the soil. Um, the fungus dominant soils have the capacity to hold more carbon and as they decay, the organic matter 
uh, they do decay the organic matter and then the fungus fruits and then the fungus you know is subsequently eaten by the grazers um, that carbon is recycled again back into the biomass this bouquet of mushrooms um, was collected one afternoon between Lawton Road and Shirley in the Squanicook River. So I would say that in this particular area, we have a fungal dominant as opposed to a, a bacteria dominant soil in that area. Um, and with this slide, I just simply want to show you how thin and sensitive that veneer of life in the soil profile can be. If you have a garden, you know how important carbon is to the success of your plants. But if you've ever seen a site cleared for development with the trees felled and the land grubbed and the topsoil stripped, you can appreciate how thin and delicate that living veneer actually is. Disruptions by the land development activities and even agricultural activities like tilling, it's one of the largest, most overlooked sources of carbon dioxide emissions, um, minimizing disturbances and maximizing life will help us balance the carbon cycle. So um, now to move on to the nutrient cycle, the food in the system, which along with the carbon supports the growth of our biomass. Um, and this is where we get into discussions of water quality. Proper cycling of nutrients in our headwaters is fundamental to preserving water quality downstream. If we go back to that water slide analogy, if we send all the food downstream, we'll have an overgrowth of biomass and it will be less diverse um, in the places where the nutrients accumulate and we'll end up suffocating our, our oxygen dependent aquatic species. But if we cycle it gradually downstream like Archimedes grew, we can maintain our complex ecosystems and diversity all along the river network. Um, so I'm going to stick to nitrogen and phosphorus. Those are the two nutrients that we typically talk about um, with respect to water quality. For nitrogen, the natural source is the atmosphere. Um, the chemistry of nitrogen is really complex, and I'm not going to get into the different flavors of the ionic exchange, but nitrogen itself as the noble gas is not bioavailable until it undergoes the fixation process. And we have natural processes to do that, um, the bacteria forms a symbiotic association with photosynthesizing plants like our legumes. And together they bring atmospheric nitrogen into a form useful for life. The human source of nitrogen to our rivers and streams comes from the application of nitrogen-based fertilizers on our agricultural lands. We don't create this nitrogen from nothing. We also happen to extract it from the atmosphere in our own way. And when we have excess nitrogen leaching out of our soil as a soluble nitrate, it moves downstream. It has a particularly bad impact on our coastal estuaries and our near shore systems. So when there's an excess, um, we'll have algae blooms, damage to fish and shellfish, and a hostile change in the chemistry of the waters. So again, here we see the, the best we can do to encourage healthy rivers and streams is to maybe put less nitrogen in our agricultural systems but also to encourage that churning of life, the cycling and recycling of nitrogen and biomass all along the river corridor. And phosphorus, I thought, as I was researching this, I didn't quite appreciate, but unlike carbon and nitrogen, the atmosphere doesn't play a huge role in the phosphorus cycle. Phosphorus has a much longer term cycle that has to do with the geologic time scale, an uplift of historically marine sediments and the weathering of phosphorus rich rock. Um, we do have some species on land that can um, gather their own phosphorus from the rocks, think like our lichens, for example, our, our primary, primary species, primary colonizers. Um, but phosphorus um, is also concentrated in many forms of our waste biomass like think like guano for bats and birds it's so important to us to keep phosphorus in our you know upland cycle that the sludge from the bioreactors at deer island for example are reused and reprocessed as fertilizer we try not to send our phosphorus straight to the ocean because we won't get it back for eons so again 
the human source of access to our headwaters is the application of fertilizers on agricultural land. Um, and phosphorus has another strange or you know special feature. It binds pretty strongly to soil, and so the reason the, the reason <laughs> um, and when that soil is submerged and wet, it leaches out of the soil and it moves downstream. One of the primary losses of phosphorus from our land is actually related to erosion and sediment transport. So um, if we are experiencing phosphorus abundance in places where we don't want it, it may be because we are actually forgetting to protect our soil. Um, phosphorus is considered the limiting nutrient in freshwater rivers, lakes, ponds, and streams. It binds notoriously strongly to fine sediment. So anywhere we have sediment deposits, we'll have long-term perpetual leaching sources of phosphorus. And when there's an excess, we have overgrowth of bacteria and algae and then subsequent oxygen problems. And the best way to restore balance is to stop applying it or losing it from our agricultural fields um, and to encourage diversity and complexity of life along our river corridors. So next I'll talk a little bit about sediment transport since you know it's instrumental to our phosphorus cycle. Um, human activities in our headwaters disrupt the sediment transport. We cause two specific problems related to sediment. When we destroy vegetation or remove large wood from our rivers and streams, we cause erosion on the landscape. And this erosion increases the volume of sediment moving through a system. Temporary sediment problems come during construction often. The eroded material can disrupt the animals that rely on that large cobble and boulder beds for part of their life cycle. Um, or fine sediment in the system can outright suffocate our, our, our fish, you know, they can foul the gills and suffocate um, the aquatic wildlife, you know, instantaneously or immediately. And conversely, sometimes we interrupt the natural sediment transport. We build dams that collect the sediment upstream and starve the reaches downstream of both the sediment and the nutrients. That nutrient rich sediment builds up behind the dams and can lead to our nuisance blooms of algae and vegetation. So, but now we've got to a dam. So I wanna to move to the next part of the story here about the importance of headwaters. Up to this point, we focus how, on how water, food, and nutrients, and sediment, and carbon generally move downstream. But this is not and should not be a one-way system. We need to complete the cycle. So we're going to move back upstream. My colleagues in the Pacific Northwest reminded me of the importance of the upward migration of particularly salmon, but here we have our trout and our herring. Uh, for spawning and for returning nutrients back to the headwaters. In particular, um, two of the species are really strong swimmers. A herring aren't particularly strong, but the trout and the salmon are really strong swimmers. And um, they deliver what they've accumulated from the ocean back to the headwaters. They can overcome some pretty hairy natural barriers. Um, and if we've done our job building a dam and we've made accommodations for fish passage, they can overcome you know, some man-made barriers. But really important with respect to the salmon, they move upstream, they spawn and they die. And their, the riverbed becomes strewn with their rotting carcasses and provides food for both the aquatic species and for the land dwellers. And then you know, the bear, for example, moves some of that nutrition back upland and contribute um, to the adjacent land areas. Now, the Atlantic salmon don't provide this function any longer. Um, they're endangered. As for me as a New Englander who haven't, you know, I've traveled out west just a couple of times now to visit my coworkers, the scale of that salmon migration just captivates my imagination. It, it seems amazing. 
But here on the East Coast, we don't necessarily have a living memory of the salmon fishery. Um, and, you know, by accounts, you know, it rivaled the conditions in the Pacific Northwest. So we have a shadow of that function. Um, the Atlantic salmon, you can't harvest it, it's endangered. And they're doing a lot of work, especially in Maine and New Brunswick to restore um, salmon, salmon habitat. So what prevents the upstream migration of our species? Um, we have dams. Um, here in Mass, this is uh, the Hollingsworth and Bose Dam on the Squamacook River. Here in Massachusetts, or here in the Nashua River watershed in particular, we have almost 300 dams. If we were to take all of these dams out tomorrow, we still wouldn't be connected to the ocean. We'd still have to tackle some barriers to fish passage on the Merrimack River. Most of these dams are small. They no longer perform a useful function. They're relics of the past. It's expensive and time consuming to maintain them and keep them in place. And it's expensive and time consuming to take them down. But through, um, through work with our partners here at the state, um, we're chipping away at them, you know, one dam at a time. It's a really slow process. So dams are significant, but if we really want to talk about the deaths by a thousand paper cuts with respect to upstream migration, our transportation network, a modern wonder of the world, where you can drive from Anchorage, Alaska to Panama City without much interruption doesn't accommodate the continuity of all of the other networks seen and unseen. Every place where our roadways cross our streams are designed to pass vehicles for sure, and hopefully water, because if you don't allow for the passage of water, the water is gonna take out your road, but not much else. Um, it's very expensive to design a stream crossing that can pass all the other things that we've been talking about today, you know, like sediment, debris, wood, the aquatic and the land animals, you know, some as large, you know, moose. Um, and all these animals used the river corridors as their transportation network. So we have interrupted the network to create our own network. Um, and typically, when these stream crossings are undersized, they act like high pressure nozzles and they generally create conditions that look like this. Um, this is Harris Road in Ashby. It's a project that I worked on with the NRWA um, and Martha. So it was a very beautiful place to work. So I put the photos on here. Um, when you have an undersized culvert, you know, maybe on a local road, it doesn't get a lot of traffic. It doesn't get a lot of attention. People put in the cheapest, simplest solution that they can. Um, it's undersized. So during slow periods, sediment builds up on top, you know, debris doesn't pass through, it builds its own little dam and you end up with a pool upstream. Um, and then looking downstream, because during high flow water is confined into that nozzle and it comes blasting out the end of the pipe, you end up with a scour hole. And then eventually um, that scour hole migrates down in the profile and then the water no longer touches the invert of the culvert. And so if you had a, a, a fish species that couldn't jump, you know, this is, this might as well be a dam to them because they can't overcome that discontinuity. So um, here's a quick analysis that I put together on our mass DOT roadways and our USGS river network. This shows over 2,300 intersections between the streams and the roads. Harris Road isn't even on here because it was too, the stream at Harris Road was too small to be part of um, the USGS data set. But the stream under Harris Road is important. It's fine trout habitat and may actually support year round overwintering reproducing trout populations. So we can assume that 2,300 barriers, you know, paper cuts um, is an underestimate. And um, I've actually been pleased to see that um, since 2010, MassDOT has come out with their first guidance documents to help their road designers comply with the stream crossing standards under the Army Corps of Engineers purview. And particularly over the past two or three years, 
um, Mass DOT has been rolling out trainings to uh, our local practitioners, the municipal DPW staff, you know, the people who have their boots on the ground who are called in to fix, fix undersized crossings in the communities when they fail. So um, I think that's a step in the right direction. We are moving in the right direction. And then um, what I would like to talk about now is a little, the policies that we have in place are that constrain and help us protect our headwater streams. And it's, we, this might be a, a topic for discussion because this, it, I, I've seen these rules and regulations as a practitioner doing per permit applications for developments and for restoration projects. And I've seen some of these come through, you know, during my time on the planning board, having to review, you know, stormwater and erosion control sorts of things. But this is where I see um, we can do the most work to protecting our headwaters. At the federal level, we have the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act, um, which give us a little, give us some teeth um, for implementing protections. But the Clean Water Act protects water. It protects navigable water. The authority that's granted to the federal government to regulate and protect water comes, is derived from the constitution, but it's derived from, you'll often hear the commerce clause referred to. And so the reason why the federal government was granted authority to be able to protect water was to protect the, our economics, to protect our commerce to protect our foreign trade and our interstate trade. And so I think that what we find is that hamstrings us a little bit, especially in the last five or six years, um, because when challenges move up through the judicial system, if we can't tie back our justifications for protecting an area to commerce and the economy, it gets thrown out. At the state level, we do have some supportive and supplemental laws and regulations. We have our state wetlands protection act and the rivers protection act and the water management act and the public waterfront act. Um, there's probably more, these are the ones I come across most when I'm doing permitting. And then we have our local um, zoning protection bylaws and ordinances. And depending on the level of commitment or experience that have come through particularly our rural communities, we have stronger or weaker language protecting, you know, stormwater um, and land development. Um, with respect to our governmental agencies, not our nonprofit partners, um, the Clean Water Act is typically um, falls under the purview of the Army Corps of Engineers. Interesting and the US EPA, uh, both the Army Corps of Engineers and the US EPA have a hand in defining what's protected under the Clean Water Act. Um, it you know, started out under the Army Corps of Engineers being navigable water. Um, the EPA you know, listed that you know, tributaries and wetlands um, also qualify for protection, um, but how far upstream do you go? Um, here at the state of Massachusetts, we have our, we have quite a few agencies under the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, and I'll put a screenshot up next to show you that. Um, I was trying to tie it all together. I wanted to be able to tie every single agency to every single nuance of protection, you know, the tools that we have to protect different things. Um, every single one of our agencies, you know, came about with a different mission. And they do actually have, you know, the resources and the purview to protect very specific things. But to tie it all together, it's so confusing. I've been doing permitting for 20 years, and every single time I start a new project, it's like I'm doing it for the first time. You know, sometimes I'm doing work for an agency, and I'm submitting permit applications to, you know, another agency in the same, on, on the same screen, and they don't agree on the best solution for protecting resources because sometimes they have conflicting um, missions. And then he, here at the local level, 
which I have come to find is actually quite powerful. We have our local conservation commissions um, who sort of administer compliance under um, the federal and state regulations. And we have our planning boards and Department of Public Works. You know, if you have a, a good DPW um, superintendent, you can get a lot of great work done protecting headwaters here in the local areas. The resources aren't necessarily available, even if their their will is there. Um, sometimes they don't have the tools to do what they'd like to do. Um, and so that's there. It is how I did it in fifty minutes. <laughs> I hope I didn't talk too fast, <laughs> but I would really love to talk about more about um, the 2015 rule specifically. We had this great opportunity six years ago to redefine what was protected in the Clean Water Act. And there was this um, man, Ken Fritz from the EPA, who has been doing research to describe headwaters in terms of ecology and function and cycle and the language that was written up and approved for a time was excellent and talked about all the different things that you know we touched on today. And if that had been integrated into the Clean Water Act, that definition of a protected water, pretty much all of our land would have fallen under the um, jurisdiction of the um, federal government or would have required review under the Army Corps of Engineers. And it was voted down um, in 2020 in particular, um, a rule, the Supreme Court voted it down. And, and so then um, the language of the rule was changed to tie back to economics and commerce again. And so there is a language ready for us and we just need to find out which rules and laws to insert those protections into um, to gain protections for that, the interface between our land and our water. Um, but it's complicated. Um, we, I can't tie it up with a bow for you. Uh, but I think there's room for, the work's been done. We, we just have to figure out how to get it into that legislative process. So um, in conclusion, I'll just put up a slide here with the key ideas our headwaters provide diversity, complexity. They're lifeboats of diversity that um, help resil They'll help, you know, if we fix some of our other problems and we keep our headwaters together, they will be provide resiliency for us. And they're necessary for maintaining good water quality, supporting rich, diverse, healthy ecosystems and restoring balance to the natural systems of our planet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. It was um, a long time since we were anticipating this and that was a very full presentation. Uh, I know we all thank you. I think we have about five minutes for question and answers, but we need to promptly stop at 10. As you see, this is being recorded. I also just wanted to give Martha Morgan a moment to share an upcoming a symposium announcement. Martha? Uh, you, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, that was wonderful, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, really great overview of why we value these, um, you know, rivers, these headwater streams. And it's a great segue to our next um, series of talks that we're going to have that are going to be supported by Massachusetts Environmental Trust. And the first one is going to be on March 4th. It's an evening talk and it's about the um, removal of the, the Quinnipoxic Dam. Um, it's the Oakdale Dam on the Quinnipoxic River in West Boylston. And that's going to be presented by Nick Wildman um, of the Division of Ecological Restoration. Um, in partnership with Mass Water Resources Authority and uh, DCR. And then we'll have other talks on river herring, which is um, going to happen on March 25th. And that's an evening, also a Thursday evening, um, promoting the return of river herring with Matt Devine, a PhD student at UMass Amherst. 
And then one, another one of these wild and scenic morning um, talks is going to be on April 6th, and that's going to be the Sucker Brook Restoration Project. So your talk about dams and the removal of dams and the importance of um, river restoration, um, culvert upgrades, um, is this is a great segue into the, all these other talks. So that's going to be um, dam removal and culvert replacement in, um, in Pepperell with Joe Gould of D, um, DER. And then we'll have other talks on mussels and the importance of mussels and um, restoration on the Nisitissit River. And then also a um, another talk by Rebecca Quinones uh, later on in the spring on um, temperature uh, surveys, doing a temperature mapping for um, trout refuge refugia as climate change um, you know, impacts our, our local streams. So. Hope you can join us for those talks and uh, we're looking forward to it. And thank you so much again, Sarah. Excellent, thank you, Martha. Um, and I did see Brian uh, Goldberg's email. We'll get back to you on that. So we have a few minutes. I myself have to jump off at 10, but because Emma is hosting, perhaps if uh, it's straight over a few minutes, that would be fine. So uh, does anybody in particular have a question that isn't on the chat? Just speak up, unmute yourself probably have time for a couple questions. Otherwise. Hello. Uh, hi, this is Vin DeVoulis. Hi, Al. Hi. Um, I, I thought the description of an ephemeral headwater was difficult. <laughs> um, we, she, you showed the picture of the uh, of the of Gibbet Hill and the cows, and you call that a headwater. It, 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 it's, it's so, uh, um, if you totally protected headwaters, it's almost like you couldn't do anything. You know, in your mind, do you have like a rule of thumb for what, where to draw the line or, or how to think about drawing the line? between, you know, business eco economics and then, you know, conservation? Yeah, I mean, this is the question. This is being battled out at the highest levels of government right now. Um, the reason why the 2015 rule was struck down was because um, the, you know, economic sector argued and won that the protection was too broad and covered too many things. Um, and we can see that we need to balance our need for agriculture and our need for you know, transportation and things like that. Um, I think we're in the process of moving towards more sustainable ways to do agriculture. Agriculture doesn't have to be damaging necessarily to an ecosystem. Nope. <laughs> um, I think that getting control over the nutrient inputs and um, practicing some of the, you know, old new techniques for regenerative farming, you know, are the way to go, but they're expensive and they're time consuming. Um, it does come back to money. It's really, it's, it's tough. But I just wanted to draw the attention there. And when I started to look at the map, I saw, I was like, oh my goodness, I was standing up the hill the other day and looking down at the trenches and that is a headwater. You can't, if you move back a step, you're in a different watershed. Yeah. So um, it, it's definitely true that impacts to that particular body of water show up in the Nashua River watershed. I don't have an answer, but that, that's, the, that's a million dollar question. Good question, Vin. Nice to see you. One last question, perhaps, anybody? So, so this is Marion Stoddard. Yes. So I have, thank you, Sarah, for your presentation. I, I have a a couple of questions, and this is about a couple of programs that uh, you didn't mention. That one are are the certification of vernal pools, and the other is floodplain mm -hmm. zoning. And it seems as though this is these are two programs that people can can uh, do something about locally, and uh, to help uh, protect our our uh, our headwaters. Well, our our flood, our, our watershed. 
yes, I, I mean, certainly we do have a hodgepodge of protections, um, you know, whether sometimes our floodplain is protected through, you know, FEMA and flood insurance, you know, we'll, we'll take the protection where we can get it, right? Well, um, as far as floodplain zoning, <laughs> or, or floodplain zoning is concerned, I think that a lot of us are concerned that uh, we need to uh, uh, to make some changes in our floodplain zoning, and that uh, we we need to uh, to be more protective than we have been, mm -hmm. and we need to change yeah. the floodplain zoning bylaws. Mm. There's well, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> much that can be done at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level. I want to thank everybody for participating today. You will hear from us as we have more offerings and otherwise stay well until we see you again. Thanks again, Sarah. Thank you very much. Sarah. Hmm.